But let's first ask the Lord to bless what we're about to undertake. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and to guide us, to watch over us, to lead us to a deeper appreciation of your love and your mercy, and form us into the people that you want us to be. Thank you for this year of faith, and thank you today in a special way for the sacrament of penance, the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of confession, the sacrament of your mercy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Joseph, our patron, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the terms that you have been reading about and hearing about that I'm afraid that if we would be asked to give a definition of, we might be a little bit stumped. And the term is new evangelization. What does that mean? The Holy Father has been talking about that. Our bishops have been talking about it. It's been in a lot of our Catholic publications. This new evangelization and focused on the year of faith. Well, let me break that apart for you. Make this real easy. The word evangelization comes from the Latin word evangelium, which means gospel. To evangelize means to carry the gospel, to carry the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. That's evangelization. Now, why are we talking about new evangelization? <laughs> what was the old evangelization? Well, it never goes out of style. But what we are experiencing as a culture in the United States and really around the world would be lots and lots of people who were evangelized. They were baptized, made their first communion, first penance before that, were confirmed, and then sort of fell off. Where our Catholic faith they might still say, I'm Catholic, but they don't think it's relevant or applicable or that it has a whole lot to do with our daily living. Now, you've seen that in the election debates, you know, right up close. The new evangelization is emphasizing going to people that already have received the gospel, but it's become perhaps dormant, and it needs some fertilization, or some water, or some tending. The weeds need to be pulled out. The rocky ground needs to be smoothed out. It needs to be fenced in so that it's not on the footpath. It's that parable Jesus told about the sower and the seed. The new evangelization, rekindling the fire of our faith in people that have already received the faith, but it's just been put aside in a way. Now, am I talking about everybody except for us? Well, I don't necessarily know. I don't, myself, I always need to be re-evangelized. I always need to be sparked up. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm never done. So I think we can include all of us in this focus of the new evangelization. Now, the bishops of our world met for three weeks last month at the Vatican. Among them were Archbishop Patrick Pinder, the Archbishop of Nassau that we know because of our sister parish relationship with the cathedral in Nassau and our sister parish school relationship with St. Bede School in Nassau. He is the head of the Caribbean Conference of Catholic Bishops. He's the president. So he went. Another person that I've talked about quite a bit, uh, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, Archbishop of New York City. He is the president of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. So he was there. Now what I'd like to lead off with this morning is a very short talk, and it really is short. When bishops get together for international meetings, they are really given, you can only talk three minutes, and they are held to that. 
So it also means that the, what we hear is really concise. Every word is thought through. His idea was that of all the sacraments, baptism, confirmation, Holy Eucharist, penance, anointing of the sick, marriage, holy orders, of the seven sacraments, the most personal one is the sacrament of penance. Now, baptism is our entry into the Christian family. The Eucharist is the center of our sacramental life. It's the reason for all of the other sacraments. They lead to, they draw from the Eucharist. But in terms of the most personal, the sacrament of penance. Now, I've had that idea for a long time. I don't know that Cardinal Dolan borrowed it from me, but I'm delighted that he talked about it to all the representative bishops and the Holy Father. The most personal of the sacraments, why have I thought that way? Well, because of this. In all the other sacraments, we have matter and form, like in the Eucharist, bread and wine. I can't use any words to consecrate the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. I need to use Jesus' words. I need to use an approved Eucharistic prayer to consecrate the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Now, the sacrament of penance also has matter, which is our sins. That's what we bring. It has a formula for absolution. However, the bulk of it is the penitent's words. We get a chance in our own words to say what's troubling us, what needs to be forgiven. And we can take as long as we like to do that. So I've always liked that idea. It's the most personal of the sacraments. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Now, these are words from Cardinal Dolan. He writes, or this is what he spoke, and this is the text. The great American evangelist, evangelist the venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, commented, the first word of Jesus in the gospel was come. The last word of Jesus was go. You ever thought about that before? His first words, come, follow me. His last words, go out to all the world and carry the good news. First word, come. Last word, go. The new evangelization reminds us that the very agents of evangelization must first be evangelized themselves. We must first come to Jesus ourselves before we can go to others in his holy name. St. Bernard said, if you want to be a channel, you must first be a reservoir. <laughs> Boy, is that smart, isn't it? If you want to be a channel, you got to be a reservoir. Thus, I believe the primary sacrament of the new evangelization is the sacrament of penance. And thank Pope Benedict for reminding us of this. Yes, to be sure, the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, charge, challenge, and equip the agents of evangelization. But the sacrament of reconciliation evangelizes the evangelizers as it brings us sacramentally into contact with Jesus, who calls us to conversion of heart and inspires us to answer his invitation to repentance. As we learned in philosophy, nemo dot quod non habit. Ever heard that before? Nemo dot quod non habit. Uh, it means in English, nobody gives what they don't already have. <laughs> if you don't have it, you can't give it. You can't give what you ain't got. Nemo dot quod not habit. No one gives what they don't already have. So we need to have the living presence of Christ within us if we're going to share the living presence of Christ with others. The Second Vatican Council called for a renewal of the sacrament of penance, but what we got instead, sadly, in many places was the disappearance of the sacrament of penance. Ain't that the truth? 
So we busied ourselves calling for the reform of structures and systems and institutions and people other than ourselves. And this is good, but the answer to the question, what's wrong with the world, is not in the first place politics, the economy, secularism, pollution, global warming, or other people. No. As G.K. Chesterton, the eloquent British apologist, wrote, the answer to the question, what's wrong with the world, is two words. I am. I am. Admitting that leads to conversion of heart and repentance, the core of the gospel invitation. That happens in the sacrament of penance. This is the sacrament of the new evangelization. Now, don't you feel privileged? The leading bishops of our world heard this in person last month in Rome, including the Holy Father. You get to hear it right this morning here at St. Joseph Parish, Avon Lake. Same words, same message, but an invitation to take the sacrament of penance to heart, and that's why we're here today. And I congratulate you for that. I like that line. What's wrong with the world? I am. I'm the only person I can control. I can influence other people, but I can't control them. One of our virtues is self-control, not other control, but self-control. I remember in the seventh grade, Sister Valerie at St. Mary's in Illyria came into our room and she said, now who is doing the talking in here? And of course we all pointed to the person who was doing the talking. And she very wisely said, now be careful boys and girls. Whenever you point a finger at somebody else, you've got three fingers pointing back at yourself. From that day on, whenever she would ask, now who is doing the talking in the room, we would point like this. <laughs> but I've never forgotten that. When we point at somebody else, we've got three fingers pointing back at ourselves. What's wrong with the world? I am. The virtue is not other control. The virtue is self-control. And that's what we're looking to do in the sacrament of penance. So I open which I always do whenever I talk about the Sacrament of Penance. I open with a question to all of you. You don't have to raise your hand. You can give yourself the answer, because you all know what it is. When did you last go to confession? When was the last time? If it was recently, I congratulate you and encourage you. If it's been a while, I still encourage you. It's never too late. Come, come. Now, how often should I go? Well, I'll give you reasons for this, but would suggest once a quarter is a great idea. Once a month is even better. You can go even oftener if you like. But when things get to be more than about three months, a season, they seem like a long time ago. Three months is a long time. That's how we summer, fall, winter, spring, that's a great way to remember that with each season to come. Why would I go in the first place? For two reasons. Because I'm a sinner, that's why I go, and because I need strength in reforming my life. I go because I'm a sinner. I've always believed that to be a good confessor for other people I also need to be a good penitent myself. My role as a priest is not simply hearing other people's confessions. It's also myself going before another priest and confessing my sins and receiving absolution. And I do. I do. I strive every month to go to the Shrine of Our Lady of Sorrows in Bellevue and I make a morning of reconciliation, a morning of, recon a morning of recollection once a month. Spend time there by myself, prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. If the weather's nice, maybe visiting some of the outdoor shrines and talking to some of the saints there. But I always finish that day talking with one of the priests and going to confession. I need to do that not only for myself, I also need to do that for you. 
Because if I'm not striving with God's grace to be the best priest I can be, I'm letting you down. You have a right to expect that I'm striving to be a holy priest. It's not just an occupation. It's not just getting the job done, publishing the reports and satisfying all the requirements of the diocese. It's more than that. That's part of it. That's part of it. I've got to do all that stuff. But it's more than that. I go for forgiveness. I also go for strength because I can't do it all by myself, nor can you. That was an old heresy called Pelagianism. That doesn't mean copying somebody else's work. That's Pelagiarism. Pelagianism is an old, old heresy that's never gone away. And the brunt of it is that I can do it myself. It's all my willpower. I make up my mind. I can do it myself. I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. And God isn't that nice. And therefore, I deserve heaven. We don't do it all by ourselves. If we did it all by ourselves, we wouldn't have needed Christ's death and resurrection in the first place. And it's not simply willpower. Now, any of you who have ever tried to make a radical change in your life and just made the decision, OK, this day I'm going to quit smoking. This day I'm going to cut out desserts. I'm going on that diet. This day, in our own histories, how many times have we made decisions like that and fumbled and fumbled and fumbled? It's more than willpower. Now, those who are involved in 12-step programs know this. It's more than just making the decision. I'm no longer going to drink. I'm no longer going to overeat. I'm not, no longer going to act out sexually. I am no longer going to, whatever it is, gamble. There is that decision, but it's with the help of God and with the help of other people that a person achieves sobriety and maintains sobriety. Why would we think it's any different in the realm of sin and conversion? I make the decision with God's grace, and then I keep that decision with God's grace, with his help, and with the help of the community, the church. The sacrament of penance makes so much sense. For someone to say, I really don't need to go to confession, Hmm. Ask a person that you may know who's in AA that may have relapsed. What happened? Got self-reliant very often. I don't need the group. I can do this on my own. Most often, it doesn't work. So why do we think in the clutches of sin that all I need to do is say, thanks, God, I'll take care of this myself? I'll handle it. I don't need your priest. I don't need confession. I don't need to tell anybody. We're going to nosedive again and again and again and again. Christ is our divine physician. When I read Luke's gospel, and I have to tell you of the four gospels, and they're all God's word, they're all the gospel of the Lord, my favorite is Luke. Now, you may like John better. You might like Matthew better. You might like Mark better. They've all got lots of points going for them. I'll tell you why I like Luke. Luke wrote his gospel after Matthew and Mark. Mark was the first, Matthew was the second, Luke was the third. John came in as last, and John did what, by and large, Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't include. But Luke was not an apostle. He was a convert to the faith. He was a doctor, a physician. That's what he did, and we find that in the scriptures. Luke was a physician. So when Luke painted his portrait of Jesus in his gospel, he saw what a doctor would see, people that were sick that needed healing, people that were weak that needed to be strengthened, people that needed a program for life and had veered off the path. Luke talks about the sick, the suffering, the alienated, the lonely, the bereaved, the, the sinful, the... I love Luke because I find myself there. 
Now, is Jesus Christ my judge? Absolutely, and I won't take that away. He is my judge. A lot of people, when they think of the sacrament of penance, that's primarily the image that they think of. Christ is my judge. Now, we have benign judges. We have Judge Bill Bilancini here. A fine example of a judge. But the judge that we think of when we're guilty in sin is not a merciful judge because we know he's right. I messed up. I really messed up. I deserve to be punished, right? That's how we think. We call that a guilty conscience. And I do not know of any pain in life that is more severe physically, mentally, or emotionally than a guilty conscience. Whenever we have one, it invades our dreams, it invades our waking moments, invades, distracts us during work, makes us out of sorts. It's painful. And when I think of Christ as my judge, well, I'm guilty. Guilty as charged. And I deserve to be punished. Now, is he my judge? Yes. Yes. But he's also my divine physician. The same Christ is also my divine physician. What does your physician do for you? Yell at you? I doubt it. Now, do you always hear what you want to hear? I doubt it. <laughs> your physician tells you the truth. To make you feel awful? No. To give you a path to get better. Or to stay on the path that's helping you to be better. Now, I know of people, and I bet you do too, that will not see their physician until they get their blood pressure down or until they get their blood sugar down. They'll cancel an appointment until they get it down. Why? They don't want to disappoint their doctor. Right? Isn't that stupid? <laughs> that is really dumb. We need a physician when things are out of whack. If we haven't been staying the course, or something else is occurring, or there's an inf we need to know what's going on here. Does that make my doctor have a wretched day? How many cases of high blood pressure or high blood sugar does a doctor see in the course of a day? The doctor sees someone that needs to be helped and strengthened. Thinking about Christ as my divine physician, what does he want? Wants me to be healthy and strong in my Christian faith. Wants to help me learn from the mistakes I made by my sins. Learn from those. Sometimes sinner's knowledge is a really powerful motivator. When we've been there before, we don't want to go back there again. No matter how alluring it is, we don't want to go back to that again. When we meet somebody that is going through that, we can be a lot more sympathetic and helpful rather than, you poor, weak, stupid, sinful, awful, wretched person. <laughs> this doesn't do much good. <laughs> rather putting out a hand. Again, that is the mystery and the message of the 12 steps. How does one person remain sober? by helping another person remain sober. Christ is my divine physician. He wants to help me. He wants to help my neighbor. He wants to help this family be healthy and strong. He wants this family to be re-evangelized, to recultivate this great gift of our faith. And the sacrament of penance helps us to do that. One more medical image for you, if you will. It makes no difference to what priest you confess your sins. It makes no difference at all. It's the priesthood of Jesus Christ that's at work there. So whether it's me or another, it doesn't make any difference. It's the same priesthood of Jesus Christ at work, just like at Mass. Mass is Mass. No matter who the priest is, Mass is Mass. Now, you may have some preferences and so forth. But still, Mass is Mass. It's still the Eucharist. 
That having been said, I'm going to make a little personal encouragement here. Is it good medicine to go to an emergency room? Yeah. We've got Dr. Seitzmar Parrish, who's in charge of the emergency room at St. John's. Excellent medicine. Excellent medicine. However, there are people that use the emergency room as their regular medical care. They only go there when there's an emergency. That's the only time they see a physician. And they use the quick care clinic, or they use an emergency room. They have no family, personal physician. Now, is that bad medicine? No. But if you go to somebody regularly, they get to know you. They get to see what works for you. Maybe what doesn't work. They know your history. Is that good medicine? Of course. Are your chances of being healthier, do they increase if you have a regular physician? Yes, they do. Obviously. Obviously they do. Are there times when you may need to go to the emergency room? Well, maybe. Yeah. When you got to go, you got to go. That's why 911 is so accessible, and rightly so. But for regular care. Well, the same thing if Christ is my divine physician, to go to a regular confessor can really be a personal benefit. Somebody that gets to know me. Is this unusual for me or ordinary for me? Is this what I'm accustomed to doing? Or is this really just stand out? This is not my usual pattern of sins. A remedy that's worked in the past. Well, let's do that again. Something that maybe didn't work so well. Maybe I'm working on something. I'll take, for example, patience. Do we say, okay, I'm never going to be impatient again. <laughs> ever, 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 ever. I'm done with that. I'm going to, it's a new me. <laughs> is that tendency still there? It sure is. If that's the way I've, I'm wired, if that's the way I've been used to treating situations, I just get upset and fly off the handle, well, that's a pattern in my life. How am I going to, with God's grace, what does he want? Well, let's take the next one, one at a time, and work with it, and work with it, work with it. But I can get real discouraged. Maybe I've been working on patience for two months now. And I'm impatient because I have not gotten the success I expected to have in two months. I'm still impatient. What's wrong here? God, hurry up. <laughs> well, for my confessor to say, but look. Look at the growth already. You took that situation. You handled it differently than the way you did before. So there's some growth there. Oh, that's good. I might not see that myself. But my regular confessor probably will, just like your regular medical doctor. Well, your blood pressure still isn't where it ought to be, but look where it was six months ago. That's encouraging. Christ, my divine physician. All right, another thing. Do I still need to confess my sins anymore? That was the title of this little presentation. You want the short answer? Yes. <laughs> We can all leave now. <laughs> That's the answer to the question. Do I still need to confess my sins anymore? Yes. Yes. That's what Cardinal Dolan was talking about. The Second Vatican Council called for a renewal of the sacrament of penance, but what we got instead, sadly, in many places, was the disappearance of the sacrament. Do I need to confess my sins? Yes. Think of someone that you care about very deeply right now. If you ever have a misunderstanding with that person, do you then just pretend that nothing happened? We'll just continue. We won't talk about it. We'll just continue. Well, we try to do that sometimes. How does it feel? Awful. We have the expression, it's like walking on eggshells, walking through a loaded minefield. <laughs> we don't feel good about it. It's not a question, is my friendship going to be over? It's not a question, is our marriage going to be terminated? That's not that. But there was a misunderstanding there. We've got to clear the air. We're not comfortable, even though it's hard to do, until that air has... 
honey, I'm sorry. Can we talk about that again? You know, oh, it's all right. You know, I was a little short too. And the air, we're better. We talk, we confess our sins not because we're telling Jesus Christ something that he doesn't already know. He's God after all. It's not for his benefit, it's for my benefit that I get it out. That I, Lord, these are the things that I need to work on. I'm naming them. I'm putting them into words. When we name things, when we say them out loud, it's very therapeutic. We get it out in the open. And then he forgives us out loud. That's the formula of absolution. I leave that reconciliation room certain that my sins were forgiven. I know that I can't do it by myself because when I tried to tell myself, oh, don't worry about it, it was no big deal, my conscience will let me continue in that vein. It was no, I know it was a, that wasn't right, it wasn't right. Something I did that was wrong or something that I didn't do that I should have done. I need to take that to Christ. Is he there to yell at me? No, I have never, ever, in 37 and a half years of priesthood, ever once, never once, yelled at anybody in the sacrament of penance. Why would I? I'm there to be a minister of God's mercy, not condemnation. So please don't be afraid. Once again, the 12-step programs know this. There is the fourth and the fifth step. Fourth step is making a moral inventory of one's life, generally writing it out. Fifth step is commending it to somebody out loud. I've done many fifth steps with people over the years. I love doing fifth steps. They're great moments of God's mercy, God's grace, God's love. A lot of times for Catholics, we do it in the sacrament of penance because it's a moral inventory. What an advantage we have as Catholics. We've got a sacrament for this. I'm not just telling somebody else, I'm confessing this to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and I'm gonna receive his forgiveness for this. The 12 steps know this. We've got to do an inventory, we call it an examination of conscience. We've gotta commit that to somebody else confessing in the sacrament of penance. Christ is the divine physician. Now, somebody might say, but I've got you here. I've got you because isn't it true that God is merciful and that God is forgiving and God knows all my thoughts, all my intentions. So how about if I just, I'll tell the Lord I'm sorry and be on with things. So you think you've got me, huh? No, you don't. <laughs> because I'm, I'm going to first tell you there's truth to that. I can't handcuff God's mercy. God's mercy is infinite and loving and personal. Yes, God does. But he also gave me this sacrament. So what to make of all of this? We have in our Catholic practice, I'm going to shift now from the sacrament of penance to the Eucharist, and then I'm going to come back to the Sacrament of Penance because I think you can see it easier with the Eucharist than you can with the Sacrament of Penance. So moving over here to the Eucharist for a moment. We have in our Catholic practice something called a spiritual communion. What does that mean? It means that any time I ask the Lord to come into my heart, to come into my life, does he do that? Yes. Yes. For instance, Maybe somebody would love to go to weekday mass, but they can't because of their children at home or their job or what, they can't get there. So over a morning cup of coffee, Lord, please come into my heart. Does he do that? Yes. Driving on the way to work with the radio up, Lord, please come into my heart. He does that. Yes. Now, perfectly, wonderful devotional practice, a spiritual communion. Now, if you're here at church for Sunday Mass, and it comes time for sacramental communion, 
and there's nothing preventing you from receiving, but you think, you know, today, Lord, I think I'm just going to stay here and make a spiritual communion. I'm not going to go up and receive your body and blood sacramentally. Would you do that? I don't think so. If you have a choice between a spiritual communion and a sacramental communion, I think we'd all take a sacramental communion. Well, move the sacrament of penance. If I have a choice between asking the Lord spiritually to forgive my sins or celebrating a sacramental forgiveness of my sins, which would I choose? Got you back, didn't I? But you see the logic? It's a gift from the Lord to us. Matthew Kelly uses the illustration of trying to improve a golf score. Why is it we're more concerned about our golf technique <laughs> than we are about our growth in the Christian virtues? Now, maybe that seems a little silly, but it's true. Matthew says, when you want to improve your golf game, what do you do? You hire a coach. What is the coach there for? Say, Everything you're doing is just fine. It's just beautiful. Just keep doing what you're doing. Come in and pay me the money every lesson, but I don't know what I can teach you, but let's just get together. Did you ever do that? You wouldn't stay with that coach. You're not learning a blessed thing. What does a coach do? Probably takes a video. Look at that. <laughs> you don't do that. Well, how do I correct it? Coach will show you. Now we'll move on to the next step. No, your foot's in the wrong place. Move it over a little bit. Does that feel better? No, it feels awkward. Well, you're not, get used to it. That's how it's supposed to be, you know? Helps you improve your game, not by telling you you're just doing a wonderful, beautiful job, but telling you where you can improve. Why are we more careful about golf technique than we are about our spiritual life? Where do I need to make improvement? What is the Lord calling me to now? He's helped me make these improvements in my life. Well, let's bank on those and keep going. I don't know with any of the virtues that we ever in this lifetime get to the, the top of the mountain. We may go, make some progress. We may slip a little bit. We make some more progress. We get a nice view, and then we look at the top. I get more. We're always on the march, but we're not doing it alone. Christ is there, taking our hand, leading us and guiding us to keep growing in our Christian life. What must I confess? I already told you the answer. Do I need to confess my sins anymore? The answer is yes. Here we have a must and we have a may. What must I confess? Any mortal sin that I'm conscious of, that I've not confessed, I must confess in the sacrament of penance. And I must confess them all, not just one if they're if there are two, I've confessed both. Because what is a mortal sin? A mortal sin is a deadly sin. We're talking about the capital sins a few weeks ago. Pride, covetousness, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, sloth. Those are the sources of our sin. A mortal sin is something very, very serious. Well, we've we got to get that cleared up. We've got to get restored to God's grace. It's not that God's grace has stopped. We've prevented God's grace. We've had a breach there. Venial sin is a lesser offense that doesn't break the relationship, but impairs it in some way. One of the expressions that sometimes Catholic use is, use is this one, and as soon as I say it, you're going to know what's wrong with it. Oh, it's only a venial sin. It's only a venial sin. All right, let's put this into human relationship terms. Think of somebody that you love. What would a serious breach in your relationship be with someone that you love? It would be telling a huge lie. It would be breaking their trust, being unfaithful in marriage, telling someone that you love you hate and despise them and wish they were never born. You know that kind of stuff? A little different from 
a little white lie, or being a little short, a little impatient, not being there when I said I was going to be there, but I was a little late in picking you up when I could have been on time. Is that going to ruin a relationship? No, but try telling someone that you love, well, I can hurt you a little bit. That's okay, isn't it? <laughs> I only hurt you just a bit, so that doesn't make any difference. We'd never say that. They wouldn't let us get away with it, would they? Why do we think that way about God? It's only a venial sin. I only offended you just a little bit, God. We don't want to offend God at all. In Jesus, he was tempted every way that we are, letter to Hebrews says, but he never sinned. Blessed Mother was preserved from sin from the moment of her conception, her immaculate conception, never touched by original sin and never personally sinned in her life. The only two people that we know for sure that never sinned, Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Mary, and his mother because in view of the fact that she was going to be the mother of Jesus, he needed to have a perfect mother. But all the rest of us, we slip up. That's why Christ needed to come into the world, to save us from our sins. Did he die on the cross for our mortal sins of people? Absolutely. Did he die on the cross for the venial sins of us? Yes. Yes. All sin. All sin. So we're trying to become a little more virtuous. I'm going to tell you something. This is something you probably wouldn't know because I'm the only one in this room that has ever heard confessions before. You've all had people entrust their lives to you as their confidant and so forth, but you don't have a sign that says, please come in and I'll be your confidant and line up, please. I'll be here at 11 o'clock. <laughs> I do. I've been a confessor for a little more than 37 years now. I've been a penitent for 56 years. It's right before my first Holy Communion. So I've been going to confession for 56 years. I've been hearing confessions for 37 years, and I'm still going to confession. I was 14 years at St. John's Cathedral, which is sort of the epicenter of the diocese. We hear confessions at the cathedral six days a week, morning, midday, afternoon. Even on my day off, I heard confessions first thing in the morning at the cathedral. That's how important that ministry is. So doing that six days a week for 14 years, you get a lot of good experience. It's everything from St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, people at the heights of holiness that are using this sacrament to respond to God's love and grow in further love of the Lord. It's people way down in the dumps that maybe have done something horrible, have been away for years and years and years and years and years and years, and have come back, maybe have very... It's the whole spectrum. The whole spectrum. There's not a sin that I've never heard before. <laughs> a lot of people think, well, this would really shock Father if I... I've heard it all. <laughs> I've heard it all. I'm never shocked in the sacrament of penance. It's like your doctor with the blood pressure and with the blood sugar. Your doctor's heard it all. He's working with this person, but he's heard, he or she has heard it all. Sacrament of penance is the same thing. I'm there as a physician of souls. So I've heard it. I also would let you know that we're bound by the seal of confession. Next to desecrating the Eucharist, that would be the most serious sin that I could commit, would be desecrating the Eucharist. The next most serious sin I could commit would be breaking the seal of confession which means that I would identify a particular person with a particular sin. I cannot do that. I cannot do that. I can't use confessional knowledge. It stays there. It makes no difference whether I know who the person is or not. It makes no difference if somebody's behind the screen or they're face to face. I can't use that information for any other purpose. I can't treat a person differently when I see them after confession. I can't use that knowledge. That's a wonderful gift of Christ in his church. It stays there. I'd also have to tell you that God has blessed me with a pretty good mind, and I'm grateful. 
but I have a very short confessional memory on purpose. I make no attempt to remember anything in confession because I can't use it. I'm there at the moment to be present to this person and I let it go. It's like hitting the delete button. Their sins are forgiven, my memory, I just, I make no attempt. Now if somebody comes to me regularly and really wants me to help them with something, well, I need their permission to enter into something we've talked about before. I can't come up later in the day out in the park and I say, you know what we were talking about in confession today? I can't even do that. They would have to say to me, Father, could I talk to you again about something we talked about in confession earlier? They would have to give me permission to even enter that arena. So I just tell you that so that you know you're safe. It stays there. I grew up with the sacrament of penance, and that's where I'll leave you today. My parents went to confession. They went regularly. I'm the oldest of six kids. Saturday morning, we'd be having breakfast, and my dad or my mom or both would say, I'm going to go to confession this afternoon. Would any of you kids like to go with me? And whether or not we did, they went. I saw that again and again and again and again. They believed it. They taught me to believe in it. And so I have gone to confession regularly my whole life. And I thank my mom and dad largely for that. Part of that in our family, we never, ever missed Mass. Ever, ever. The only excuse was if you were sick in bed. And if you were sick in bed Sunday morning, you better be sick in bed Sunday afternoon. We went. This is the honest truth. As a kid at St. Mary's in Illyria, I thought at Christmas and Easter how nice it was that everybody brought their company to our church, that we were the only church that was full on Christmas. I couldn't imagine anybody not going to Mass regularly. So I thought everybody had house guests. And there must be some other churches that were pretty empty because they all came to ours. That's what I thought, but that's how I was brought up. This is just for this year of faith, this new evangelization, this wonderful personal sacrament that the Lord has given to us. Christ, who is my judge, also my divine physician, wants to heal me, help me, strengthen me. So I encourage you in your own journey of faith. As I opened, if you're going to confession regularly, congratulations. Please keep doing it. And what I told you today, I, you know it's true. If it's been a while, it's my invitation to come back, to celebrate it again. Because the best reasoning for regular use of the sacrament of penance is having a good experience with it. And that good experience is, is right here. It's right here. You can go here. You can go any place you like. That's entirely up to you. The same sacrament, it's the same priesthood of Jesus Christ. But next to celebrating Mass, I can tell you from my heart, my next most favorite thing is to hear confessions, to help others along the way as we follow the path of Jesus Christ. He's given us this good news, the gospel. Let us be evangelized once again. Let us receive him. Let him come to us so that we can go and take him to others. I have for you today a little handout. You've had it before, but just in case you don't have one currently. This is a wonderful pamphlet published by our Sunday visitor. It talks about a lot of the things I talked about today, but in very concise fashion. It gives how to go to confession, what you do, gives an examination of conscience, how to prepare, gives an act of contrition, which you can have real handy, gives some good reasoning for this great gift, and the back there are even some references to the Catechism of the Catholic Church and so forth if you want to do some more reading. I will leave these, in fact, is Mary Ellen, maybe you can just make these available at the doorway here. 
And this is Mary Ellen Ewers Pena, member of our parish, who is the coordinator of youth ministry for our parish. In case you don't know Mary Ellen, this is her son James, who is with us today. And I want to thank Mary Ellen and Pat Vaccaro, our principal of St. Joseph Parish Day School, and Lori Coughlin, who is our parish musician and director of religious education, for helping to put together this year of faith for our parish. Thank you all. God bless you. See you around.